Author Joel Rosenberg's latest thriller, The Beirut Protocol, opens along that very volatile Israeli-Lebanese border. I met with Joel there recently and asked him why he wrote the book. Joel, great to be with you here on the northern border uh, of uh, the Lebanese-Israeli uh, border. What a great spot uh, to talk about your new novel called The Beirut Protocol, uh, which begins here on the northern border. Tell us about it. The Beirut Protocol is a political thriller. Uh, it's the fourth in the series. And it opens up on a road just like this one, in which Marcus Riker and a team of American and Israeli security officials are doing an advance trip mm -hmm. because the U.S. Secretary of State is coming for a visit uh, to deal with peace issues in the region and security threats. The Secretary of State is concerned about Iran's influence in southern Lebanon, that the terror force known as Hezbollah is becoming a very dangerous threat to Israel, to the Arab world, to American interests. So Marcus and his team do an advance trip on a road like this and a big firefight happens. Terrorist force from Hezbollah starts attacking and a massive firefight begins and tragically uh, Marcus and his team are captured and pulled into a previously unknown terror tunnel and dragged deep into Lebanon. What do you want to take people into? You're taking obviously into a political thriller. What do you want people to take from the book? I want people to understand that Iran is the most dangerous terror state in the world. Iran has proxy forces. They have terrorist organizations that they fund, that they train, that they arm, that they command. They tell these terror forces what to do. And I regard the three most dangerous ones by the three H's. It's Hezbollah, that's the terror force here that's essentially taken over southern Lebanon. Then there's Hamas, the terror force that keeps firing thousands of rockets and missiles at Israel. That's based in Gaza. There's also the Houthis, the terror force in Yemen that keeps firing hundreds of missiles at Saudi Arabia. And that's what makes Iran so dangerous. It's not just the Iranian military. It's not just the Iranian nuclear program, as dangerous as that is. But the, and that gets all the attention. But it's the fact that Iran is funding, arming, training, supplying, and commanding all these terror forces. And for people who love Israel um, and who want security and who, who have, are excited, like I am, about the Abraham Accords and all the peace deals that are going on, we have to remember they're demonic forces and they want to rob, kill, and destroy. And while this border looks quiet now, this is the front line of what could be the most dangerous war to erupt any time in the near future. We saw what happened in uh, 2006 uh, there in 4,000 rockets. Uh, many more rockets would make it even exponentially uh, a much more dangerous time. Yeah, in 2006 there were 4,000 missiles fired from Hezbollah in southern Lebanon into Israel in 34 days. The people I talked to fear there could be 4,000 missiles a day for 34 days or longer. I mean, that's the level of disaster that could be coming. We would never have seen a missile barrage um, like this in the history of the Middle East, uh, maybe the history of the world. We were just talking a few moments ago to an Israeli intelligence officer that told me, not on camera, but he said to me privately, the next war will be the third Lebanon war? He goes, no, that will be the last Lebanon war. He means Israel would unleash devastating firepower on the nation of Lebanon, a nation that is essentially held captive. It's a hostage by the regime in Tehran. It seems like a very, very tense time here with Lebanon and uh, in light of your, your new novel. In many ways, we, um, we in the West or around the world haven't really been talking about Lebanon except for the horrific port explosion in August of last year, which left 300,000 people without homes and left many, many dead and wounded and traumatized. But that was a rare moment where Lebanon captured the attention of the world. But the Beirut Protocol was, was premised on the idea that the, the next day is coming, that Iran, Lebanon, Israel force itself back onto the world's consciousness. I think that day is coming. I pray that, it, you know, God is, shows mercy, but, that, but that's my fear. And I, one of the things I try to do in, in political thrillers like the Beirut Protocol is take people into a world that I pray never happens. People have called me a modern Nostradamus, you know, that you're, that you're predicting these things, that you're a prophet. No. I'm a political thriller writer, but trying to project um, what would it look like if the people who are our worst enemies actually did what they say they're going to do. Sheikh Nasrallah is talking about wiping Israel off the planet, and he's preparing to do it with Iranian help. 
What if he does it? What if people that are connected with him really try? What might that look like? What do you want people, after they read your novel, how do you want them to respond? I, I don't want us to get into the false sense that just because the Abraham Accords are creating historic, wonderful answers to prayer, peace treaties between Israel and Arab countries, this is good. But there are two cross currents. There are two movements of history happening. Tremendous breakthroughs of peace, but the forces of evil are gathering for the next big battle. And of course, eventually, prophetically, we know that the War of Gog and Magog, this will happen right on these borders. But we need to keep praying and again, not get lulled into thinking, everything's good, everything's fine. Well, Joe, great lesson uh, to, to take from your book, and I hope uh, everybody enjoys, uh, enjoys this novel and takes that lesson to heart. Thank you, Chris. Great to be with you. I appreciate it. Alpha,